beautiful Friday. I, know, I love rain. I love when things can quiet down and you can tackle under your covers. Maybe you can sit in front of the choir. And so anyway, that's going to be our practice today is going to be all about warming up our internal domain and kind of soothing, adding soothing and warming to this kind of cold transition into the winter. Anyway, but before we get there, we have half an hour to feel. So, you know, the drill, put the questions in the chat. I got a whole bunch of different things to cover. I'm going to start with uh, a, a fascinating uh, study that was just released by um, G Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, and this is regarding effectiveness of Tai Chi on performance in older adults. Uh, one of the reasons I want to talk about this, because I actually know the author very well, I will be recording a podcast. I'm actually going to try to bring her on our podcast to talk about the study. I know she's very busy. Uh, this is the Elizabeth Ekstrom, but um, we'll see what we can do. So uh, it's a very large study. So to do a 300 plus patients in our world of integrative medicine, it's a, it's, it would be considered way on the larger side. Um, so uh, basically what they did is, so they took, let me show you the flow chart. So they took 600 some patients, screened them, and then they randomized 320 patients in three different groups. So one group was assigned to a stretching exercise, nothing special, they were uh, sort of guided, but they were primarily just kind of shown how you stretch. So then there was a participants randomly assigned to just the basic Tai Chi Chuang. Now this is a standard form. Um, I think in some time in the past, we may have tried to do some parts of this form here with James uh, folks. Uh, who actually teaches this. And if anybody's interested, I can connect you to him for sure. And then the third group did this um, cognitively enhanced Tai Chi Kuan, which is, was defined, which probably should just read this to you because it's actually pretty cool what they did. Uh, they, just one second. Um, so basically, in addition to the standard Qigong, what they were asked to do, they were, um, uh, at the same time, they were doing cognitively demanding activities. So they were involving interactive, reactive, and verbal and nonverbal instructional cueing. So this cognitive stimulating and challenging dual tasks, the idea is that it sort of like boosts Tai Chi engaging cognitive. But the idea was let's boost it even further so that it becomes like one in the whole exercise, both physical and cognitive, because this is what we think is really critical as a way of kind of preventing an Alzheimer's disease, which of course, you know, if you look at people over 80, you're going to have somewhere between 15 to 20% of the entire population end up with dementia sooner or later. So it's a very practical study, very well designed. You should ask, why did they pick stretching here in this group instead of some like something else? Well, because, you know, you have to try to mimic activity and randomization. If you compare weightlifting to Tai Chi, it's not a fair comparison because they're quite different exercises. So this kind of a gentle stretching sometimes used as a control, you know, it's kind of hard to actually be precise here as to what the best control is. Now, of course, this is not um, randomized blindly, right? Because you participants know exactly what they're getting. I mean, they're either getting stretching Tai Chi or Tai Chi plus cognitive training or cognitive cueing rather. And so, you know, it wasn't ran, it was randomized, but it was not blinded. So that's obviously the weakness, but there's no other way to do something like this. And so then when you look at sort of what happens um, in groups, so 76 year old was an average and looks, seems to be pretty comparable, you know, in general in studies like this, well, guess what? This are self-selected group. Now they randomize, but they're self-selected group. So it's a little harder to drag us men who are not interested in their health compared to the women who are generally much more health interested in their health. Anyway, so this is a typical. So we, this is what we see across the board in most of the studies. Um, I will say that obviously, look at this, this was primarily non-Hispanic white, which is a, obviously a problem, which is a problem in many studies, but it is what it is here. Um, so I'm going to skip through this and then show you what actually happened. So they measured a couple different things. So they measured something called MOCA score. The MOCA score is the most common cognitive clinical assessment. It's easy to do. It's highly practical. 
it is most commonly used in every country I understand what it is. It's not a comprehensive, complex research tool. It's a major strength while small weakness. Major strength because it's very applicable. It means that if I talk to my patient who walks into the door, a 76-year-old white woman with her usual whatever her problems are and ask me what exercise should i be doing if i'm going to talk about this study it's perfect because i can look at her and say okay well you just scored 25 on the mocha you may start developing a little bit of a cognitive problems which is what that 25 here means so these patients were potentially evolving into the early cognitive impairment and that's what happened so when they took tai chi group with cognitive enhancement, they had an improvement that is unprecedented, people. We've already seen things like this in some of our programs and some other studies, but this was a profound benefit. It's four points almost improvement. My thinking why that happened goes to the fact that knowing how they designed the study, how they ran it, and how the actual follow-up was they engaged cognitively people way above what they usually would be doing because they were challenged. They were challenged to the extreme and they were challenged not just, okay, you got to move your leg this way. Oh yeah, it doesn't go that way because I've never moved my whole life like this and I'm 76. Oh my God, oh my God. Oh, you're doing this. Don't worry, we'll push you to do it. That in itself is very strong motivator for the brain to start rewiring things differently. But they also cued this cognitively. So they kind of, they did this from several angles. And you can see that the difference between all three groups was pretty significant. So the stretching, as you would expect, nothing happened. You would not expect anything to happen. You would not expect in 24 weeks, which is, you know, about um, half a year, right? Six months, roughly. So you wouldn't expect in six months to have much of anything happening there. It's just going to be flat. And it is. You would expect in Tai Chi to get a little bit better because that's been done before. Many, many times, large studies, we know that Tai Chi gives a couple of points improvement, but then it just flats out and it stays there. Now, we don't know what's happened here with the actual cognitive plus Tai Chi. It's hard to say whether this is point of plateau at 24 weeks or it was a continuous improvement. Um, I hope they get more grants and I haven't talked to Elizabeth yet. I will in the next couple of weeks to try to get a sense, are they planning on running this longer? Because I think that's a problem. The problem is where they ended it. I wonder what will happen here. And obviously you don't have a whole lot more up to go. I mean, you're already here at almost like 28 and a half. You only have a point and a half left. And it's unlikely that you're gonna cross 29 just because 29 is completely normal. 28 is normal. 27 is normal. 26 is borderline. 25 is slightly abnormal. Just giving you a breakdown on this scores. They measured a couple other things, which are probably not all the one of the functional um, costs in um, in this Misha, percent. Sorry. It's not very. Misha, old. sorry to interrupt. You're breaking up. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Hold on a second. Maybe my that is not connect right. Um, it is connected, right? Let me try to move positions. I'm going to unhook myself here and move over to another room because I think that's what's going You're going to see me moving, but I can multitask. So, um, so what, what basically, um, that second scale is, I don't want you to think about it, except that it's a surrogate test for a functional status. And as you would expect, there's also going to be some improvement there, which, which is seen. Um, what's, uh, less clear why they didn't, for example, pick something like um, speed of walking 100 feet or get up and go test, you know, like a more common scales. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I, I talked to Elizabeth years ago about how they set up the study. We didn't discuss what exact scales they use. So I don't have an answer to that, but eventually I will. So if I if we do a podcast with Elizabeth, I will definitely, um, well, if we do that, then we'll post it, then I'll probably come back to the study. I may even ask Elizabeth if she has time to come and talk to us. So you can look at this whole bunch of other things here that were much more research-based. I don't want to go into their long story short, the improvement across the board. Like this study, the, magni the significance of this study is, and by the way, I just want to point this out, this is Annals of Internal Medicine. It's basically 
as high as New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA. This is one of the most prestigious journals. And the fact that they allowed the publication in there of this magnitude, I think is very good. All right. So first, let me see if we have, and anybody have any questions about this? Um, and by the way, the Tai Chi form that was used was a kind of a standard modified young form, 24 movements. Um, it was sort of adapted. I think I, I probably not the best person to discuss this in great detail because, um, you know, I you will have to ask the study designers exactly how the how that was set up. Okay, and then so I'll put the link to the article. Right. That's now. exactly what I was about to ask you. Sure. So if anybody wants to, this is actual article. This is actual PDF in case you want to have the actual entire study downloaded onto your computer. Okay, so let's shift back to, all right, let's see what my next topic is today. Okay, the next topic, I think, was to talk about COVID. Um, talk about this really cool article, which I didn't read the whole article. I don't, I'm not going to, but um, this is coming from uh, our favorite media player washington post so the old-fashioned remedy may use covid gargle and salt water i guess so i have probably talked about using um native pot which is basically the same thing except that in native pot you in addition to gargling you're also using the nasal wash and we also talked in the past about adding a little bit of propolis and a little bit of tea tree oil like maybe three to five drops of each into the mix why am i always sort of telling this to everybody well because this old fashion method traditionally used in pretty much all of the naturopathic and integrative medicine practices thought to be very effective. It's kind of nice to see suddenly something like this come up. And again, I'm probably not going to download the study because I don't need that for me. I already, it's not going to change what I do, but it's cool. So they took 50, let's see, I think they had 55 patients in the study and, um, basically assign them to use low or high dose of saline for gargling and re and, and uh, rinsing nasal passages. And, you know, basically they've seen a pretty dramatic decrease in hospitalization. They kind of speculated maybe a little bit too good to be true, regardless of all that. Um, I think it's nice to see something like this being validated. So what's actually happening here? Because you're taking uh, a third of a teaspoon of a salt. I actually use a little bit more. I recommend usually half a to a full teaspoon for a cup, mixing it really well, and then gargling and doing both, so mouth and nose. Well, you know, in essence, what you're doing is uh, your nasal passages when, when you pick up the disease, uh, this is one of the biggest areas of multiplic multiplication of the virus, right? So when you're able to wash it and slough it off with a concentrated saline, in essence, that's what you're doing. You're making a saline solution and you're washing it off. You're just decreasing the load. So you, 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 you're making the virulence smaller. You, in essence, washing your hands, if you will, right off of whatever the, the, the bacteria that's in there. Um, so why am I adding propolis and um, tea tree oil? It's just it's supposed to enhance the effect of that. So when you're in adding the antimicrobials to it, and I'm a huge proponent of propolis, mostly because propolis is actually known to be antiviral, versus if you put anything else in that, you could put antibiotics theoretically and do the wash. You can put uh, agents like xalitol, which are blocking adherence, but you're talking about bacterial, you're not talking about viral. Propolis and, uh, is the only molecule that I'm aware that has an antiviral properties. Tea tree oil does not. Tea tree oil, in my understanding, mostly becomes an antifungal and antibacterial, but propolis is one of few natural substances that is basically works against any infection, including virus. So hooray bees, I always believed in them and I always will. So if you're not a bee, Believer, sorry, but you can still believe in propolis. You don't have to believe in bees, but yeah. You know. Okay, so that's a topic number two. Any questions about this? And and I wonder who's doing this. I wonder who's actually doing regular rinses, not just when you're getting sick, but just like chronically, especially in this cold weather, especially in the winter when we tend to kind of carry and pick up more stuff just by the 
being more indoors, more in closed spaces, having a higher chances of interacting with people in an enclosed space, not outside of in the nature. So, you know, you may want to pick it up. Uh, the, the recommendation goes very simple. Gargle and do the native wash and, and nasal washes every time you brush your teeth. It's going to add two, three minutes to your hygienic time. It's very easy. I will tell you there's only one trick, and that is to pick the salt concentration right. You don't take enough. You will call Dr. Kogan and yell at me for 10 minutes because you're hurting so much. If you take too much, you're still going to call Dr. Kogan because it's still going to hurt too much. Uh, you have to pick a right concentration. Um, it doesn't actually matter if you make it slightly more concentrated. You just need to make sure you're not hurting. If you're not hurting, you pick the right concentration. A uh, half a cup of salt for, for glass is a good place to start if you want to remember that. And please don't use any fancy salts. Why would you? Just It doesn't really matter. Just pick any, any quickly dissolving salt, put it in, mix it up. If you have propolis or tea tree oil, add only a couple of drops. If you add too much, it may end up being actually negative and maybe burning. And um, especially uh, tea tree oil. Propolis is a little bit more forgiving. You can put a little bit more and it'll be okay. Uh, propolis does tend to stain everything. So when you're doing washing, make sure you don't spit it or it doesn't end up on your clothing because then you won't be able to wash it off. It's like a very strong yellow color. Um, so yeah. And then you'll have to explain to people it's not your urine. It is the bee urine. Well, rather bee poop, to be precise. That's what that is. Propolis is a bee poop. It's a special poop that they produce to seal the, off the hive from any adversities of the environment. Works really well, except for bears. I guess that doesn't work against bears. Works about everything else. Okay. The third topic of the day is... I need to pull it up. And that is, let me close off all these things first. Okay. And so that's what, uh, that's also COVID related. That's what um, I think Janet found for us. So let me put this up. This comes up all the time. Now I do warn you, this is not a precise diagnostic tool. Okay. But it does tend to give you a little bit of an idea how to think about symptoms. Uh, part of the reason why I sort of, first, I didn't want to talk about this, but then I had, a, I have a personal family situation, which is very unpleasant right now. My stupid brother, I can say that, I think, well, we've had a difficult relationship over the years and I kept telling him, so he started developing basically cough and fever. That was pretty much it. Never gotten truly short of breath, but then start getting skin problems. So he started getting this weird like allergic reaction, like looking things on his skin. Went to one physician, to the second, to the third. I keep telling him, Alex, you got to do COVID freaking test. Just do the test because it takes five minutes. He's like, it's not COVID. I'm like, what is it? He's like, I have pneumonia because one doctor listened to me and says pneumonia. And then they did x-ray. There's nothing. They still give him z -pack. Meantime, a week passed by. He's still having weird symptoms. Fever subsided. He's still... So then another week passes. Now it's like week three. Suddenly he's getting worse. Uh, so his cough is kind of whatever. It's kind of going away. But he's starting to get on and off fever, more skin problems. Still no problems with breathing, but now he has a little bit more of a fatigue, like, like gradually growing. You see where I'm going with this. So then yesterday I get a call from my parents and my father has a 39 uh, Celsius. So it's like 40. Uh, it's not 40. It's... Uh, a hundred and whatever he has a high grade fever like 103 <laughs> and actually oh you guys don't take the photos i'll put that in the in the chat in a second and so i said look go around do the COVID. of course he's positive so basically my brother never treated his COVID right probably still is a carrier despite that it's been three weeks it sometimes happens so then he gave it to his parents because he was assured to himself why i don't know he did one negative test in the beginning and said, that's it, that's not good. And I kept telling him, do two, three or more. So the lesson here is overlap is massive. So he had did not have aching. He did not have breathing problems. He did not have a fatigue. Okay, he had a low, he did not have low, he had, he had not, no sore throat, he had no wheezing. So if you look at this, he had more, much closer to like pneumonia or maybe something closer to like common cold or something but you know he had almost no sore throat he just had a cough and low-grade fever and then all the skin problems 
So point being is it didn't present typically, but I kind of sensed that when, when he was developing the story and when he was talking about, I was like, you got to test multiple times for COVID. It's some unusual COVID presentation and, and, and you have to rule it out in essence with multiple tests. So if he would have done that, he wouldn't have come to see my dad and he wouldn't have given it to him. So hopefully my father at 87 will recover quickly, but he's now obviously on everything starting today on Paxlovid and on all the vitamins. And, and the problem is that that of course, mom is right there with him so she's probably also going to get it but at least they're isolating for now anyway let's look at the table so i think the most important distinguishing factors from colds rsv flu and COVID are the top two so it's the breathing problems and it's a uh, um sorry it's not breathing problems it's aching there's this kind of a muscle pain muscle aching and then fatigue so generally speaking, cold and RSV is not going to give it to you. It's possible, but it's much less likely. Um, you can also see that the sore throat seems to be, but again, look what just told you with Alex. Sore throat, I would completely ignore. Sore throat, if it's not there, it doesn't mean anything. If it's there, it makes it much less likely to be flu or RSV. It's much more likely to be just common cold or COVID. So those are the big ones. And then any prolonged respiratory symptoms, basically much, much more likely to be RSV. But this is generally tends to be severe. RSV causes uniquely severe respiratory symptoms. There's a reason why it's called respiratory syncytial virus and not some other virus. So, so I assume there are questions about this. So now it's a good time for us to do questions. And I will be putting this in the chat right now. So you guys don't have to look for this okay all right uh if you rather i'm gonna stop sharing if it's okay with everybody if we need to bring that table back up i will but i want to look at the questions and see what we have today a half a cup of water to uh yeah you can do a half to a full cup of water for like i would use um if you're using a full cup don't use more than a teaspoon of salt so use about a half a teaspoon per cup it, it, there's a little bit of individual uh, proportions there. Some people like, I like a little bit more salt. You may like a little bit less. Again, the point is the comfort of a nasal passages when you're doing the, the gargling, that's most important. If you ever go to the ocean, you know how you can just take the ocean water and do a nasal washing? That's kind of the concentration you want. Like that's a typical like a salt water. All right. Um, Okay, the length, standard dose, flu block. Okay, Cecil is asking about vaccine. Mm. So people who are allergic to eggs doesn't mean that they're going to be allergic to the vaccine. This is a very important point. Um you don't actually care about that unless you have a very strong reaction to eggs and and or documented IgE reaction. Most of the time when we talk about food allergies, we're talking about IgG. They have nothing to do with vaccines. You don't need to worry about it. If you've ever done the um, allergy test with the blood and it showed you have IgG to eggs, don't worry about vaccine. It's very, very unlikely to be manifesting as a reaction and then I don't think it's a problem. Egg vaccines have been used for a long time and I don't see any problem with them. So if you need to do get high uh, for 65 plus high potency egg-based vaccine, by all means, I don't have a problem. Okay. Supposed to go to my regular dental clinic this weekend, got a call to reschedule because the hygienist had COVID. Very good, very good. What uh, good for hygienists? What what is to 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 tell everybody? What is a safe amount of time to postpone appointment? Okay, and that's a good question. So <clears throat> probably uh, the ten standard days, assuming the full recovery, that's still holds. Uh, that's what I use with everybody. If you want to be really thorough, uh, you could ask hygienist if if that person did a neg test and it was came negative after that that's you that's reasonable i uh, think to do but usually i say 10 days so if you postpone it by two weeks and hygiene is, is perfectly fine and have no symptoms i think you're completely safe good question thank you 
Okay. Thoughts on RSV vaccine. If you have any pulmonary problem and you're over 60, you should get RSV vaccine. If you don't have any pulmonary problem and you're very strong, you're healthy, you don't have a lot of medical conditions that can suppress your um, immune, re immune system, I want to wait. I want to wait for a year or two and see how the vaccine realistically performs. I want to see follow-up studies in real life. I want to, it is a recombinant vaccine. Remember, we're a little worried about getting too many of those in a back-to-back -back fashion within a few weeks. You hear my caution, right? I'm just pragmatic in terms of new things that are pushed on us because they did some study. Until some post-marketing occurs, I'm only going to vaccinate high-risk patients. And those are the ones that I just mentioned. Um, so warm water, yes, warm water. Warm water is always better whenever you do any kind of hygiene because, right, especially don't do cold. Room temperature or warm is perfectly fine because that generally is much better for, um, you know, you don't want to put cold water and kind of cool the tissues when you're doing different washes. They'll clump up and you're potentially going to be less effective. Yeah, from the faucet is fine. So uh, people always say, well, should I be filtering the water? Okay, that's a good point. Uh, so I would say the following. Uh, if you have a central filter in a, in a house, no. If you have an easy filter to use, please filter the water that goes into nasal cavities. If you're just gonna, uh, if you're not gonna do neti pot, if you're just gonna do the gargling in the back of a throat, don't worry, faucet is perfectly fine. And you especially speeding up. But if that water goes into your nasal passages, I would use filtered water. You don't have to use distilled or anything advanced, but I would use filtered water because the uh, small amount of bacteria that may somehow end up in a faucet, if it doesn't go out or into your stomach and has a chance of remaining close to the sinuses or in the sinuses can actually be a problem. General statement, but it's actually a good question. Uh, yes, please, uh, for people over 65, do not get a standard vaccine. Strong data that is not very effective, no matter what manufacturers are telling you. Uh, this is a personal question uh, to me, and I'm telling you, you, you have, if you're 65 for COVID, you must, uh, for flu, you must get high potency vaccine. L the standard potency vaccines don't work. Um, they work, but they're, so let me, let me give you some numbers with the flu vaccines. At the peak of a season in the beginning, uh, if the flu vaccine gets 50% efficacy, it's wonderful. Um, at the end of the season, if they're still at 20, 25%, it's great. Usually it ends up in a single digits in the spring. And if you get, if the older adults get uh, standard vaccine efficacy is down at least 10 points, 10 to 15 points difference. So please do not get standard vaccines. And it doesn't matter that it's been approved for adults over 18. That has nothing to do with that. FDA approval does not equal efficacy. FDA approval based on combination of efficacy and safety. So over 18 approval simply means that patients over 18 qualify to get the vaccine. It doesn't mean that it's the best vaccine for a particular individual, okay? So don't get confused with what the pharmacy, pharmacist, or the company that makes this product tells you. You have to look at the data and you have to talk to your physician. So. You can definitely boil tap water. It's perfectly fine. Um, that's definitely another way. Catherine, thanks so much for mentioning that. That's actually also really good. Um, uh, it's a very easy way. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, I wouldn't wait any longer to get a flu shot. Very good point. Thanks, Cecil, for pointing that out. Because we're already in a kind of a first end of, like close to middle November. Um, you know, I would get flu shots now. Like I wouldn't wait any longer, even though nobody's still seeing a flu. We are seeing a lot of COVID though. I will tell you that. I haven't seen a single flu case in the last two weeks or three weeks. I've seen, well, and now including my brother and my father, it's probably at least a dozen of patients in the last 10 days. So we've seen two patients in the clinic. They had symptoms, they walked in, I, I kind of walked into one, one patient, patient didn't tell me anything, was without a mask. And then suddenly patients started coughing. I'm like, do you have this for a while? And of course I put the mask right on 
I was like, do you have this simple like, Yeah, for the last two days. I'm like, did you check yourself? No, I, why would I? So we ran the test right in there, of course, positive. So, yeah. so, so the, the, the point being is there's a lot going on. So my suggestion is please mask when you go into not outdoors, when into indoors, when you're traveling on enclosed spaces, buses, airplanes, mask up. So link to study requires you to enter GW password. Oops, uh, apologies. Which study? That's the Tai Chi study. Yeah, I forgot about that. No, 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 no. I, I went and got it, downloaded it, put it in a public place. They need to click Ooh. the link lower. Oh, thanks, dear. Because I, I, true, I forgot about that. I mean, I have access open all the time for journals just because all the time. But um, OK. Well, if there's a question about any particular, like we actually, I think officially we're not allowed to give you a link. To, if, if it's a password protected, it means we can't give you a link to the full study. But if you email us individually, we can attach it and email it to you. That's perfectly fine. Nobody's going to say anything to that. Um, so, but we can't put things in public places with a full article links. That's like actually a violation of um, copyright for us. But but individually, we can distribute articles if we feel that the particular individual is benefiting from them. Then and and clinician or administrator have access to that. Just so clarify. Do, I, do I need to take that link down then? You need to take link down from recording so okay. that it doesn't end up on the YouTube. But if it's just in the, I don't think that that a chat automatically ends up in the YouTube. So I think we're okay. Okay, cool. Yep. I think any, we're just not going to do that. Sometimes I think we did put the chats in, right? But let's not do that today. Yeah, but, no, we don't do We haven't done that for a long time. So, so perfect. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, one more last question. Anybody, something on your really hot list for questions? How do you treat RSV? Ooh, good one. All right, let's that let's make that last one, okay? Um, uh, Cecilia, it's up to you. You can. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly address her question. You can either either one. I mean, I think flu ad versus flu zone. I don't. My my idea, just like with COVID vaccines, get whatever is convenient. Like whether it's Pfizer or Moderna, we have this whole idea of crossing over. It definitely doesn't matter. It definitely doesn't matter with flu shots. You don't have to cross over. They're different every year. Whether to get flu, high dose flu, out of high dose flu zone. I don't know. Just whatever. Whatever is available. Don't worry about that. Okay, how do we treat RSV? That'd be the last question. Do you need to mask for traveling? Usually when you have RSV, you're not traveling anywhere. Um, or if you are traveling, that's not a very smart idea. Because RSV generally at least nowadays is a lot more symptoms like you're going to be coughing and you're going to be breathing difficulties having so i wouldn't tr i wouldn't travel with that if you're recovering uh, yes i would mask up just so that you're partially protecting people around you but remember masking um even with kn or n95 is not very highly protective for others compared to how it's protective to you right so all those masks protect you better so if you have an illness of any kind respiratory and you're coughing you know yeah put k95 or surgical and inform others that you may have a disease and if you already pass the kind of a critical window you're feeling a lot better you're still coughing probably you're already not infectious. If you don't have fevers, you don't have other symptoms, you're just coughing because you still have a junk sitting in your lungs and you're just kind of clearing it. I don't see any problem with at that point. So unfortunately, the test for RSV is not available to be rapid tested to like just say, okay, I'm negative now and I can go travel. So how do we treat supportive? Very similar. You can actually treat it exactly the same way as we treat COVID minus Paxlovid. Other than that, a NAC and acetylcysteine is really important for RSV because it's very good for helping to clear junk from the lungs. Um, uh, people who have a bit more symptoms with RSV, I give them inhaled glutathione. We talked about that. If anybody's interested, I can put the link to my YouTube channel on that, but that's a very good method. Um, uh, and it, why glutathione? Because you can get NAC um, for inhaled Unfortunately, it's often done only in a hospital. So obtaining the prescription from a doctor for that may be a little bit tricky. Uh, but anything else um, in terms of getting glutathione, um, we can get you compounded um, 
you know, it has to be a high, it has to be injectable grade. So either NAC or glutathione, I think either one is fine. And I'm going to put that into the chat. That's the YouTube describing how you do that. Other than that, again, just treat this as the standard COVID. So zinc, vitamin C, nasal washes, uh, incentive spirometer, because chances are you're going to have more lung problems. <laughs> incentive spirometer helps you to expand your lungs. Very typically with both RSV and COVID, there is a something called atelectasis, which is a partial lung collapse. You want to prevent and treat that because the more lungs are open, the more they aerate it, the faster you're going to recover. And also the less symptoms you're going to have. So that's a really important point. It's also something that's essential to prevent secondary pneumonias, which in certain cases can be devastating. In fact, most people who die from flu and RSV, they don't die from flu and RSV. They die from secondary pneumonias because you got weakened lungs. And if you, God forbid, get exposed to something during that time, you will end up with getting that. I hate this background. I'm going to turn blur thing off. So, okay. Anybody else lost something really burning? But otherwise, let's begin to shift. And I'll need a minute here to get ready for for the practice. We're going to do, um, as I said, warming, right? It's cold outside. So just find comfortable position. If you need to lay down for this, it's perfectly fine. If you need to turn off the video, that's fine. Um, you do need to be very comfortable and particularly there's one component to this. What I want you to do right now, I want you to figure out how you're going to sense your pulse. There are different ways you can do. You can just simply take your hand, put your fingers over your pulse, over the, over the wrist and sense it that way. You have a second place, you can put your hand over the neck. Okay. You can also put it over the heart if you're skinny enough. Um, if your breast is not kind of interfering to positioning it there, you can try. Sometimes some people can feel that. You can also just sense it. Some people, myself included, I can just tune into my own pulse without measuring it. So it's not precise. You know, this this practice has nothing to do with calculating precise. You don't worry about that. You're simply trying to connect to your heart first with a physical domain. That's what the practice is. So this is a heart-centered breathing practice. Sometimes we call it quick coherence technique. We've done this while back, um, actually more than once, I think, but this is gonna be a little bit different. We're going to combine this centering on the positive emotion and on the heart with a pulse and then some kind of a core warming up breath. So maybe if you're ready, close your eyes. Begin gradually slowing your breath down to a comfortable place. Inhale and exhale through the nose. If you're still running 1,000 miles an hour like my mind right now, after chasing all that data and talking about all these articles and all these fancy methods of preventing and treating COVID and RSV and all that, so just let go. So imagine that all your thoughts are like clouds in the sky. And we're just here tuning into our bodies, letting go of our mental domain, beginning to center our attention into the middle of the chest, right, right there. If you want, you can just kind of gently take your fingers and let's do it all together whether you're laying down or you're sitting, and you're just gonna massage right in the middle of the chest for a minute or two you know, to kind of gently press into the sternum and do a rotational element, or maybe just left to right, or maybe up and down. Just going to stimulate the center for about a, maybe let's do two minutes, a minute or two, whatever it comes to. Take a couple of deep releasing breath. And then gently lower your hand. Now that you've activated the center, just tune into the space where our physical heart lo locates underneath the bones of the ribs, the rib cage.
And see now if you can connect your breath with the pulse. Try to tune into sinking inhale and exhale with the, with the heartbeat. So maybe you wanna do four heartbeats on inhale and four on exhale. Maybe you need to do it a little bit slower, maybe six and six. Maybe even eight and eight. But do use a roughly equal formula. So inhale and exhale about the same length. Sometimes I find it very useful instead of trying to find a pulse on my neck or on my wrist, I literally kind of imagining my pulse in the heart. I'm imagining, sensing the pulsation in the chest. And I don't know, maybe it will work for you too. But when I do that, I literally start picking out the, the heartbeat that way. Before we actually drop into the practice itself, now allow to sense this pulse starting from wherever you are sensing it, whether it's at the wrist, neck, or in the chest itself. See if you can begin tracing the pulse to any part of your body that's pulling you. Maybe it's to the toes or to the mouth or to the fingers. The pulse obviously goes to every part of the body. In essence, we can learn to concentrate on a pulse absolutely at every level, at every tissue, at every ligament, at everywhere. All of our tissues, with few exceptions, are supplied by the blood. And we can tune into those vessels, picking up each heartbeat by the nervous system at that particular area. Let's do this for a couple more minutes. Come back into the heart, come back into the center of the chest. Now just continuously sensing the heartbeat and sense the breath in and out, equal, not forced, not strained, if you're straining anywhere, uh, feel free to reposition. You may need to lay down, or maybe you need to simply wiggle your parts of your body a little bit just to relax them more and stretch them. Reposition your head if you have to tuck your chin. And return to the breath and to the sensing the heart in the middle of the chest. your breath naturally slow down, allow it to continue to do so, allow it to taper off. It's okay if it becomes gentle, if it becomes kind of feeling superficial, it's your breath, just stay with it. If it's comfortable to maintain deep breath, deep paced breath, do that. And now this next part, while we're tuning into our heart, we begin to add into each inhalation, we're gonna imagine bringing in a positivity. And the way we're gonna do that, you may wanna think of someone or something that ignites this deep sense of awe, the sense of kindness, joy, Maybe it's a bliss, maybe it's love. Anything that's very joyful to your heart. 
imagine that sensation and imagine the object, person, an animal, a place that resonates, that leads you to that awareness of that particular emotional, positive emotion. And so when we inhale, we're going to bring that in, into our hearts. Feel it filling us up. And then when we exhale, letting it all get exchanged back into the all-pervasive space that's around us. And then continuing that. So we'll do this for at least let's do it. Let's do close to five minutes slowly. Here, try to slow the breath down without straining, without discomfort. But truly with each inhale, sensing how your heart gets filled with this positive state of love, of respect. Maybe it's a kindness, maybe it's peace that we also need right now. without losing concentration on this breath. Imagine that when you exhale and when you release that positivity, now imagine that kind of merges into the all around us, into this constant field of peace, constant field of positivity, if you will, all around. Even if you don't believe in such things, just imagine that this is happening. So that when you in again inhale, you have this continuous exchange, you're bringing this positivity. And then when you exhale, you release it back out, sharing it with everyone. And if it helps you, I'm going to unspot myself and if it helps you look into screen and see other people and sense that this energy circulating between all of us if it's helpful for you to do so if it's helpful for you to see other people ultimately we are sharing the one environment the one earth and i will go as far as to say we actually all share one breath Bringing it in on inhale, feeling your heart with the love, with the kindness, and then exhaling, giving it back with each breath.
Let's gradually begin to disengage. Move your fingers, move your toes, roll your head, come back. So some people call this heart-centered breathing. Some people call this quick coherence. And it probably doesn't matter what you call it. Um, the point of this practice we just did is when you feeling the heart with the positivity, and I don't know the reason I wanted you to connect to your heart. I don't know if anybody felt change in the pulse. I don't know if anybody felt heart slowing down a bit, maybe getting more regular. Uh, maybe with each breath, speeding up a little more and then slowing down a little bit more with exhale. I don't know if you pick that up, but it's actually measurable. So if we ever talk about heart math again and how they measure that difference in the heart rate variability and how it has a pretty profound longitudinal long-term benefit for our health. So we did that basic core practice. And this is the practice that I um, often give to kids, to my kids. I love this practice because it's very simple and yet it's extremely powerful practice, like bringing that love and care and positivity into the heart and keeping it there and then exchanging it and creating this reciprocity of, with each breath. Ultimately, that's what we remember, right? We remember that this is exchange. It's never, I'm gonna take it all or I'm gonna give it all. It's a balance. Hope you liked it. Sorry, it's today only me. Um, I don't know uh, what we have next week. I, I don't know if Janet has a second to look it up. Um, otherwise, enjoy the cloudy, cold, magnificent <laughs> last weeks of fall that we have. Um, Give me a second, Misha, and I'll post. Yeah, I'm gonna show you the leaves out of my window. So I find I find it very gorgeous and our uh we had first year right there is a um fig tree and first time in years in all of its life it produced like i don't know probably five pounds of feeds pretty cool all right so next week we have ashley talking about oh wow next week we have a powerhouse so we have ashley doing um resilience and well-being talk of some sort i actually don't know what she's going to talk about and then tiffany so tiffany is our one of our chinese medicine physicians and she's going to do a practice um i'm sure it's going to be related something to internal qigong or some kind of other chinese medicine practice so please join i um it will be quite interesting and i'll be of course there uh, as well answering your questions and maybe i'll pull up another study or two. Seems like there's a lot of good studies coming up these days. Uh, for the uh, Tai Chi study, I'll be doing a video. So I think next time I'll, I'll do it by next week. So I'll make sure that I go into a lot more details on the study with a lot more significant conversation. So please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't. Otherwise, don't worry about it. I'll post it in the link next week when it's out. Everybody enjoy the weekend. See you soon.